case our title leads you to believe this is a railway film, we should tell you that it refers to the famous all-seasons resort of Bournemouth. But since the expresses form an efficient and speedy method of getting there, the railway is quite an appropriate introduction to this town of amazing growth. Speeding southwards, we soon leave the suburbs and enter the even, open country. This in turn changes as the countryside becomes more undulating and wooded, until forest land, so typical of southern Hampshire, is reached. Eighty years ago, of course, the railway did not run as far as Bournemouth, then a village of only 600 souls. Among them, however, were some far-seeing inhabitants who seriously discussed the possibilities of their wonderfully situated village. And not even the original Bournemouth bells could detract them from their set purpose. Those three wise men of the 60s saw more than bathing beauties. They saw a great town developing out of their village. And from the old pier approach, they saw its growth into a fine and well-planned approach to the sea. Yet even those men, as they looked along their coast, could hardly have foreseen the phenomenal progress that would be made in so short a time. They always realized, however, that the cliffs were a natural gift, and those who succeeded them kept the coast unspoilt. With the chines running down to the sea, the exceptional shelter of the bay and the miles of golden sand, nature has been generous to Bournemouth. Today, there is an added attraction of a wide promenade along the entire length of its coastline. What of the town itself? Well, this was the square of 1865. And this, near the same spot today. In that short period, the population had grown from 600 to 130,000. 70 years of irresistible progress. Just as the natural beauty of the coastline was preserved, so were the natural amenities of the town itself retained. The Bourne stream ran through the natural parkland, and it still does today. Along its entire length through the town, it is bordered by public gardens, which eventually penetrate the very heart of Bourne. The Bourne stream has its children's corner, where the youngsters can play in safety. There are games facilities for everyone in the 1,200 acres of gardens and parks. Those early planners left a great inheritance in such stretches of undulating country as Merrick Park, barely a mile from the pier. Ernest Whitcomb is the professional on this course, while Queen's Park on the other side of the town has Don Curtis. Obviously, he can train dogs as well as golfers. Actually, one acre in ten is given over to public parks and gardens. And it is the sense of openness and the foliage that makes Bournemouth so attractive and the tree-bordered streets so characteristic. The square is the hub of the town and every activity seems to radiate from it. Here's a bus bound for Boscombe and Southport, so let's go aboard and go for a ride through the shopping centre. The ground on which the shops on the left are built was conveyed 80 years ago for £86. Pounds. This is the actual deed. Today the site may be worth a million pounds. Thus has Bournemouth grown. Straight ahead is the Municipal College and Library on the corner of the Christchurch Road. A two mile ride brings us to Boscombe. And a further short run to Southbourne, which like the rest of the town has left its cliffs free and open along the whole of its length to Boscombe. A three mile stretch that is a joy because the sweep of the bay can be seen from so many points.
that, of course, is Boscombe Pier below. We're in Boscombe now, and if you want games, well, there are opportunities in plenty. A fine pier and approach is the feature of this part of the borough, which grew rather later than Bournemouth itself, but no less rapidly once it began. The yellow sands are fringed by an undercliff promenade for miles in each direction. And because the water recedes so little during the four daily tides, these sands are attractive and safe. What a pleasant contrast the modern Lissom bathing girls are to the heavily clad bells of the 70s. This is progress indeed. In fact, progress seems to be the watchword here. One of the latest acquisitions is the sun terrace overlooking the pier. They look happy, don't they? Everybody's happy here, you know. But this sun terrace is conveniently attached to the new suite of baths. Built at a cost of nearly £100,000, it contains, besides a variety of private baths, this well-equipped indoor swimming pool. In addition to normal swimming, there are often aquatic displays, such as this clever log rolling. It looks as easy as, uh, well, falling off a log, doesn't it? But one thing, it's no easier than ice skating on stilts. These clever skaters appeared in an ice review, which is a feature of the summer program. Swift and graceful, there surely cannot be a more delightful spectacle to watch, nor a greater thrill to experience. Summer and winter, the ice skating rink is thronged by the public, who revel in the smooth, clean surface as they glide to happiness. Always thinking of new methods of attracting both visitors and residents, Bournemouth has now built an indoor bowling green, the largest in the world with eight full-length rinks. Whilst we're on indoor topics, we mustn't forget the dancers. These are well catered for in the ballroom of the pavilion. This municipal pavilion is the pride of Bournemouth. Apart from the ballroom, restaurant and lounges, it has under its roof the world-famed symphony orchestra. With 61 players under Richard Austin, it is the largest permanent municipal orchestra in the world. Those three men looked ahead, but surely they could not have seen such a consummation of their ideas and ideals. years ago, Bournemouth, a village along the little river Bourne. Today, still Bournemouth, but a fine, flourishing resort, using but preserving the gifts with which nature has so richly endowed her. The grandness of this orchestra is surely the symbol of the town. Nothing is good enough but the best. <laughs> 